good uh, evening. Oh yes, we we are we we did check the recording. So we um we uh, yes, I can I can literally see people from all over the world here, which is fantastic. So hello to uh, all of you. Um, we are. Uh, I don't think we could have a better start for our uh, convergence lecture series uh, this academic year, which is, as you know, also about to start here. Um, we have uh, invited and have been able to uh, have with us today here um, Professor Stephen Doherty, who is based at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Um, and uh, Stephen is, uh, well, I start with the admin, Stephen, you are, um, have been for quite a while now, I think, uh, a deputy head of school in the School of uh, Humanities and, uh, uh, and Languages. Um, but, two more uh, months, two more months. Two more yeah. months to go. Well, okay. nearly there. Yes. <laughs> That's perhaps the best about these roles, they don't last forever. But uh, in a more, much more permanent role and uh, I suppose more enjoyable. Uh, Stephen is an uh, um, associate professor of uh, linguistics, interpreting, and translation, and he is also the lead of the language processing lab uh, at the University of New South Wales. And uh, with a background in uh, ling um, psychology and linguistics, um, Stephen's research focuses very much on language processing, human language processing, I should say, and uh, how that underpins translation, interpreting, also audiovisual um, translation. I think you have worked across all of these parts of our discipline and uh, um, have been very successful in capturing external funding for this research, which has allowed Stephen to, to uh, well, do a, a lot of empirical research on this, which um, is very difficult to do without uh, the famous funding. And uh, methodologically, um, Stephen employs quite a wide range of approaches, including uh, psychometric approaches, eye tracking, um, which brings me also to today's talk. Um, today's talk um, is also methodologically focused um, uh, as a presentation, and Stephen will talk to us about, in fact, what we can learn from a method such as eye tracking about uh, remote interpreting, which, of course, sits in the realm of interpreting, but is also a very multimodal and audiovisual activity. So who could be more interested in that than myself? Um, so Stephen, and we are all very pleased um, uh, to have you here and uh, the floor is yours. We, we let you talk and at the end, I hope we will have uh, time to, uh, for a Q&A session and to discuss this. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, Sabina. Thank you for the warm welcome. And the good thing about being in lockdown is that I'm stuck to answer all the questions all night. So there's no rush. <laughs> I, have nothing, I have nowhere else to go, right? <laughs> and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So nice to see um, so, so many new names, but also some familiar names uh, all around the world. So it's really, really lovely. So thank you for joining us. And um, so good to hear um, this is first in, in a series. And I know your series from um, the last year was also um, so successful as well. So really happy to join and contribute to the ongoing discussion, particularly when remote interpreting is becoming such a big issue, or in many cases, not an issue, which is even more concerning. I'll just set up my um, screen to share my slides. Um, first of all, um, can are we okay? Can I get a thumbs yep. up? Yes. Yeah, we're good. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. And so, um, much as uh, Sabina had said in, in the introduction, it very much focusing on, on methodology here and coming at it from as a very kind of methodology person um, with his background and looking at um, translation, interpreting very much from a language processing point of view, um, not just the process, but also what it means in terms of the products, as we often call it, and what that impact um, is on professional practice, specifically here with interpreting. Um, but also, you know, I've looked at other eye tracking in other areas like machine translation, audiovisual translation as well. And the, the project um, I'm going to talk about today are very much um, collaborations with um, in interpreting scholars. And I'll start out um, with some acknowledgements here. Um, Professor Sandra Hale, my wonderful colleague here at, at UNSW in Sydney, but also um, colleagues at Griffith University, uh, Natalie Marchuk and Professor Jane Goodman de la Hunty at University of Newcastle, um, particularly for the um, collaboration on the first project, which will be the main bulk of the, the presentation today and the funding um, secured to do that, 
but also towards the end, I'll tell you a little bit about this really exciting project, project that just has started and um, that I've got some of my own funding to continue this work. So I'm really excited to um, see where it goes and, and perhaps even share more with, with you in the future or, or collaborate um, in this um, really exciting area, I think. So first of all, some practical questions with remote interpreting, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, interpreting and what's happening in the re remote context as well. I'll basically sum up some of the, the previous research that's um, most relevant here, and then take you through a, a perspective of how we look at interpreting in terms of the, the cognitive load or the eye movements and what all of that can tell us about interpretation practice, performance, and hopefully how to improve practice and, and performance and make sure that um, the accessibility and availability of interpreting services increase, but also that we don't have negative consequences in terms of quality, performance, professional standards, and so on. So I'll talk a bit then about how, how eye tracking could, could um, be useful in, in this type of research, which is very much applied research here. And I'll take you through um, the focus of the first project, which is looking at consecutive and simultaneous mode and audio and visual media in remote um, legal interpreting. And then, as I said, toward the end, I'll talk a little bit about uh, focusing in on the temporal aspects and some next steps that I'm working on in terms of identifying features in a model and, and, and moving more towards the application of how technology could help um, in this space in the future. Um, and then, of course, very happy to, to um, discuss and you'll, you'll I'll have some points at, towards the end around some limitations of this. You know, eye tracking tells us a, quite a narrow story in many cases, but it'll be really interesting to hear different perspectives um, and particularly across different aspects of the discipline. So I, as, as we were chatting just before we begin, we don't really need to spend too much time convincing you that remote remote work, remote interpreting has really um, boomed in the last couple of years. But it's important to remember that even before the pandemic, it was really something that was increasing quite a lot. And for many of us, um, you know, in universities, working um, with government or industry and so on, um, it maybe wasn't something we did every day, but it was certainly something that was becoming more and more common, um, particularly in interpretation. So essentially, we're talking about remote interpreting where the interpreter is not physically present at the same location as one or more of the other speakers. And there are different scenarios of this working from home. Um, one of our partners here in, in Sydney um, has a, an office where the interpreter can go. So they're not in their own location, but they can go to kind of a more secure office that has really good internet and all of those uh, equipment and things like that. Um, so there's quite a diversity in terms of how it's actually operationalized, but at its core, it's essentially this, this remote working. Um, and as I said, prior to COVID, it was something that was increasing in availability and accessibility. And some of you may even know Zoom we're using right now um, added um, quite a while ago an interpretation function as well. And it's something that you see more and more um, in various teleconferencing software um, be because that's really uh, even before COVID an indicator of people were requesting these features using this type of uh, mode of interpretation. And it was something that of course then since COVID has really, really boomed in many areas. And specifically, um, today I'm talking about the legal area. Um, why are people using remote interpreting? So obviously, with physical restrictions as we have now, um, that's the only option. But if we were in a scenario where face-to-face -face is an option, remote interpreting um, could potentially reduce the time and costs associated with um, traditional face-to-face -face interpreting in that the interpreters don't have to travel to that place. It's easier, um, perhaps even kind of instantaneous to turn on software and have the interpreter show up on the screen. And this is particularly important um, in regional areas for language pairs uh, that are not frequently um, represented, minority languages, migrant languages, new and emerging languages, as we call them here, indigenous languages and so on, but also with specialization such as medical, legal interpretation and so on. So we don't all, always have um, trained and certified uh, interpreters in every language pair, in every specialization where we would need them, whether it's in the courts, in a medical situation and so on. Um, so the potential is quite exciting, right? Um, and um, I, I think there's this risk, which will you'll see coming up quite a lot through the talk, 
that it, it's sort of a reductionist view that it's it's so easy, almost like machine translation, right? You, you hear people saying, well, I can just type in something in Google Translate and I get the translation done, easy, right? It makes it very trivial. And anything with an app, any, any sort of risk we have with technology of making something really easy and user-friendly has that sort of underbelly where it then kind of trivializes, simplifies, or reduces, and perhaps even increases the risks therein. So this is something that's really, really important to keep in mind. Um, obviously, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this over the last uh, 18 months, um, technology doesn't always work. We have lots of risks uh, with using technology, and this is something so, so important in a remote setting. Um, and so, so important in remote interpretation, where, as I'm sure you appreciate, even working face to face, there are risks of miscommunication and, and so on. It's a quite a complex cognitive, linguistic, sociocultural task, and, and there's really a lot going on, to put it very simply. Um, but adding technology to this mix, we have, and again, I'm sure many of you have experienced this in Zoom or Teams or whatever software you're using, um, where we can't hear the person properly, there's a distortion or a delay in the audio or the video, and there are gaps, we don't always hear the full um, utterance that people are um, making, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but on the other hand, and as I mentioned with the idea of, of making it really easy to use, pretty much if you've got Zoom and a laptop and you're bilingual to some extent, or you can kind of fake it that you're bilingual, you could now offer a remote interpreting service, which you know sounds really, really exciting, but also really, really scary. Um, and this is really, I think, really indicative of, of the world that we're working in today where we've known for quite a long time through the internet that we can you know, can collaborate offer goods and services all over the world. But really in the last couple of years, this has really, really happened. And that we, it's much, much easier and more commonplace now to work remotely. Um, and there are issues with this in that because there's a lower um, bar or easier access to offer interpretation services, um, there's also an increased risk that the adequate training isn't there, the certification, um, lack of preparation, particularly in legal settings, which has been shown to have such a detrimental in impact on performance and outcome. And also a lot of users of um, remote interpreting don't really know or understand or give a second thought to all of these factors that are at play, particularly in a busy courtroom or in a medical context. And as we know, um, and, and some of you here have done, done excellent work on this in, in the past, there are many risks already associated with interpretation, but these, this remote aspect to it could really amplify and have such a detrimental impact on the, the risk of a miscommunication and so on, um, both in consecutive and simultaneous mode, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. But what's a little bit more dangerous about it, like with machine translation, I keep coming back to, um, is that because it's happening remotely, we may not necessarily, as users of interpreting services, know that something isn't working. Um, whereas at least face-to-face -face in, in a courtroom or in a medical setting, it's easier from uh, you know, verbal and nonverbal communication um, to participate and for the interpreter um, to fulfill their role. And so in many cases, we could say that remote interpreting is a, is a viable alternative to face-to-face -face interpreting. And I'm talking more if we can think ahead to this optimistic future we were just talking about where we'll return back to the office and, and whatever that looks like in the future. Obviously now in many cases, at least for me right now in Sydney, it's the only option. If I wanna contact my GP, it's remotely. If I wanna teach my students, it's remotely and so on. But thinking ahead, what sort of impact will this have um, on the future in returning face-to-face -face or not, or, or a blended sort of fashion as we might see in many other sectors. Um, but for many um, users, it's uh, remote interpreting represents um, a, a potential solution and something that might be you know, too good to be true in many cases, especially where language pairs or specializations are limited, as I mentioned. Um, but we don't fully understand all of the, the parameters of remote interpretation, particularly in the legal settings that I'm going to talk about um, this evening. So do we know if there's an impact of interpretation mode, simultaneous or consecutive, and the medium, whether it's just audio or it's visual, on the process and the product of remote interpretation? Is performance effective? If so, how? 
Um, do the parameters that we um, use in current practice in face-to-face -face interpreting, which we know we're also research on that and, and pushing the boundaries and, and improving standards and best practice, of course, but does current practice face-to-face -face necessarily just transfer over into remote? Um, do things like um, breaks, turn-taking, and all of that just naturally hand over? Um, or are there unique risks? Um, can we uh, mitigate or at least raise awareness of those risks so that we can make informed decisions, um, both as providers, but also as users of interpretation services? So focusing in more on a legal context here, the consequences of miscommunication um, are really, really significant, as I'm sure I don't have to convince you but also barriers and access to justice are critical issues. Um, issues around improper process, procedure, and improper outcomes, and um, not just around the as, as, uh, access to justice aspect, but also in terms of mistrials, cost, efficiency, and so on. So many significant um, potentially ne negative impacts for all of the stakeholders involved in the process in a legal setting. And in most domestic legal settings, um, we see that the default mode is consecutive. And while chuchotage is used, um, it's typically not so commonplace and in simultaneous where we typically see this at the, you know, the International Criminal Court, international conferences and so on, it typically is used with equipment. Uh, as, as an example, in Australia, we see the interpreter in consecutive mode typically uh, placed next to the witness in the domestic setting, um, whether that's courts, tribunals, and interviews. And other colleagues, in, including um, my colleague Sandra Hale here at UNSW, have looked at those uh, the impact of that on credibility, performance, and so on. Um, so there are really significant um, there are there's a really significant in, in impact on many of these factors that st other stakeholders might think are trivial where someone sits and um, the sort of verbal and non-communication, uh, non-verbal communication channels and so on. Um, but all of these things do matter and we know that. There are also um, different, different style, different approaches, quantitative, qualitative, online, offline measures in the literature on looking at accuracy and performance in face-to-face -face interpreting compared to remote. Um, and some of this work I mentioned already, where essentially the risks of miscommunication um, are, are, are potentially amplified, as I mentioned. Within legal contexts, and, and I'm moving into a more specific forensic setting now, um, they also, there's also a, a significant impact here on the efficacy of established interview techniques, particularly around sensitive topics like terrorism um, and, and so on. Um, Communication, of course, is essential, but essentially um, the, the investigators have a very particular um, method of building rapport with an interviewee, asking questions in a certain way and um, to get a particular outcome. So that in and of itself separately is an area of research uh, which is well established in, in terms of forensic linguistics and, and, and psychology and so on. Adding interpretation, particularly remote interpretation to this, um, really, really um, amplifies the risk of miscommunication and those elements of building rapport and so on, which we'll get to a little bit later, um, also come to the fore. Um, we see that in the literature also the impact of mode can be a little inconsistent in terms of there's quite a diverse range of, of interpretation settings as I mentioned before. But by and large, we see that consecutive mode requires more time and it has been shown to limit the natural flow of communication as the interpreter has to stop and, and start after the segment, the need for the interpreter to take and read notes, the management of turn taking and so on. And as I mentioned before, this is particularly problematic in legal settings with building rapport and establishing these investigative interviews. Consecutive also requires speakers to modify their speech into smaller segments to be more manageable um, so that the interpreter can keep pace. And in many cases where um, you, you'll see in, in our data here, the suspect um, isn't used to watching or working with uh, an interpreter. This can be unfamiliar and also um, disrupt or add extra um, effort or, or, or labor into speech that can become unnatural or fragmented in different ways. So essentially consecutive can, can take more time, disrupt the natural flow and um, result in the interpreter working in terms of uh, taking notes, managing the turn taking and so on. 
On the other hand, simultaneous is, is faster because it's happening in a simultaneous manner, of course, and, but it does require specialist training, equipment, and so on. And training and proficiency levels of interpreters is something that's often not considered, um, particularly of interpretation um, users. So it's, it's, it's also, it's sort of like a double-edged sword that it, it sounds much easier, but it's also more difficult um, because of this training and equipment and so on. Um, but as I said, there, you know, there are pros and cons in different contexts in different ways. And we really wanted to see how this would play out in a remote setting, looking at um, a forensic interview. So I'll move now into the aspect where I said, well, well, how do we look at all of this in terms of a, a psychological perspective? And cognitive load theory is used quite a lot in language processing research, um, in cognitive psychology and educational psychology and so on. And it's something that is often used, um, cognitive load theory or working memory, when we um, use eye tracking as a method. It, it really helps to underpin and explain what we observe with eye tracking phenomena. So cognitive load theory is in a nutshell based on the notion that we have a limited working memory and a processing capacity um, in our brains. And we have different types of cognitive load for different tasks. And the idea around this is that um, we want to engage in tasks that have an optimal level of cognitive load so that we have good performance, be that in translation, interpreting, learning, um, you name it. And we can be overloaded where performance dips as a result and, and, and so on. But a lot of this research looks in the educational domain at how we can make, for instance, slides such as the ones you're looking at now or videos or um, books in mathematics more, um, more manageable to students or to viewers or end users in terms of cognitive load. Um, many colleagues already have started using cognitive load to look at interpretation and process and product. Um, Jen, for example, uh, recently looked uh, at a systematic, systematic review, um, really excellent um, piece of work looking at how um, cognitive load theory has been conceptualized and operationalized across the discipline um, to look at interpreting practice and essentially trying to understand the difficulty and the nature of the task and to find out how interpreters deal with the, the significant challenges of the interpretation practice. And um, here we find this very, very useful in looking at in, um, interpreting performance um, within remote interpreting, because previously, and this is something that Chen and other colleagues had difficulties with, um, in face-to-face -face interpreting, it's often difficult to use an eye tracker or to measure cognitive load, whether it's with EG, EEG, electroencephalography, galvanic skin response, you name it. And it can typically be used as an offline post-task questionnaire. Um, but oftentimes it, it means putting somebody in an unnatural setting, like in a lab or wearing eye tracking glasses. And we'll have some pictures of those later. Um, so it's difficult to get um, real life face-to-face -face interpreting into a context that has that ecological validity, but also allows us to use methods like eye tracking and to start looking at things like cognitive load. And um, remote interpreting changes that because people are already looking at the screen um, for most of the time. So here we're talking about cognitive load in the sense that it's the interpreter's um, load in, in processing the information required to in integrate all of this multimodal information that's, that's on the screen. So the visual and the audit auditory information, how they're being presented, how they're working in a very dynamic way, and then doing the interpretation. So there's so, so much happening in the remote interpretation process. And it's, it's, it's quite difficult to kind of disentangle and see the effect of each. And that's something we're hoping to shed light on with um, this work today. Um, often we see with cognitive load or with eye tracking, um, the use of what's known as the eye mind hypothesis or the idea that um, we, there's, there's a, a link between what we fixate on in terms of our eyes or overt visual attention and what we're processing in our brains. Um, and there are some physiological aspects um, related to this that we're, we're in an evolu evolutionary sense predisposed um, to be attracted to hands and faces and also movement. So, you know, if, if a cheetah jumps out at us, we'll notice it um, very, very quickly. And um, so there are lots of these evolutionary things that come into our visual system. But essentially, we have a very limited capacity in our visual system. Um, there's a lot of information um, around us that we have to filter out. 
think about this right now. We're looking at a screen, there are slides, there are voices, you might have it set up where there are faces. Outside of your computer, there might be things, something at the window, there's a light, there are noises going out on the street or in the hallway. So we're very much in our everyday lives and filtering out um, what we deem at that moment in time to be unnecessary visual or auditory information to focus on or select the relevant information. And it requires a lot of, um, a lot of energy and, and practice, particularly in such a complex um, language processing scenario we'll look at with this study. Of course, this isn't this is overly simplistic. There are also lots of aspects related to memory and motivation, individual differences in first and second language proficiency. Um, and there are lots of theories that are um, very well established in terms of empirical evidence around how we process language, particularly in, in, in multimodal and multilingual set settings. But essentially, we have a very limited processing capacity um, and a very limited auditory and, and visual input. And within an experimental setting, we can control for many of these. Um, but of course, there are many limitations and caveats to cognitive load theory in that we could be looking at something on the screen right now and thinking, oh, I've got a meeting at two o'clock or what am I going to have for dinner? Um, but it's really, really difficult and not very sustainable to look at input like the slides on the screen or my face as I'm talking and think about something else. It's actually really, really difficult, this idea of the, the dual task paradigm. Um, so we typically, um, by and large, process what we're looking at on the screen. And this is really, really important later in terms of what eye tracking can tell, can tell us, but also, as you'll see in the results, what eye tracking can't tell us and where um, further work will tell us a little bit more. So some of you, um, just to show in, in terms of reading um, how eye tracking works in a very basic sense. So here's this um, sentence here. Um, the government plans to lower taxes were supported. You'll see here along the top, these fixations, one, two, three, four, five, which relate to these red circles um, and these lines or saccades, saccades often pronounced, one, two, three, and four. And essentially our eye is never stopped fully. It's always moving around, scanning the environment, looking for cheetahs behind the next tree. And um, so we, we typically fixate very, very quickly um, onto a word or a stimuli of interest. And we typically have, um, as we'll see on the next page, um, acuity around the size of our, um, our, our thumbnail. So if you put your, your thumb out right in front of you at arm's length, that's the visual acuity you have. The rest is all peripheral vision. Like you can see here in this little graphic around how it blurs as we, as we um, move away from the central point of focus. And this is something really, really important, um, obviously in many language tasks, but within interpreting and remote interpreting, the need to look at everything that's happening on the screen and process language and interpret that language as we go through. Of course, this is overly simplistic. As I mentioned, there are many other factors that come into play around working memory capacity, the, the frequency and density of the word, the context, our prediction or prior knowledge of what's being said, or on motivation, individual differences, if you've had two coffees before that performance or not, if it's the end of the day, if you've been interpreting for six hours, if you've just uh, taken an interpreting assignment for the first time, or if you've been doing it for 10 years, or even if you're an expert interpreter in legal settings, but you've never worked with Zoom before, it's different cognitive load, different context. So there are many, many attributes. Um, and of course, in an experimental setting, we try to control or remove many of those so that we can um, test in an empirical fashion um, what it is we want to look at. But that was a, a pretty, pretty brief crash course into eye tracking, essentially very limited intake. We have to focus and shift around all of the time to process information in a more focused manner. And that really has an implication for how we understand and hopefully improve remote interpreting. There are lots of different devices um, within eye tracking. And so these glasses that I mentioned before, these um, kind of add-on devices that you can pop onto the bottom of the computer up here. Some Chen, for instance, looked at note-taking on a tablet. Um, some people now are working remotely. So we might use eye tracking on a, on a laptop via our webcam, um, and then the more um, high-end, more clinical uh, monitors where they have a higher temporal resolution. So really looking at very, very specific um, phenomena. So um, depending on the, the, the temporal resolution and the spatial resolution of the hardware, you might be able to look at 
um, the, the tip of that accent on top of the letter O versus just that whole word or that whole subtitle or that whole phase. So depending on how granular you need your data to be, the hardware um, options um, change as well. But they all work on this fundamental um, principle. So the first study, as I mentioned, is part of a larger project funded by the um, High Value Detaining Unit with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And it's a project led by Professor Sandra Hale at UNSW and Professor Jane Goodman de la Hunty at University of Newcastle. And my role was to focus on the eye tracking component, which um, I'll talk to you um, much more about. But essentially, the project was to compare face to face and remote interpreting the impact of our interpretation mode medium, as in audio or uh, video, participant profile, and very much uh, a holistic multidimensional approach to interpreting performance. Um, so there's much much of the work that I'll cite, um, and you can see it here in Hale et al, 18, 19, and 20, and I'll have links at the end, um, relate to earlier parts of the project, where especially um, the comparison of face-to-face -face and remote, whereas here I'm, I'm focusing in on remote interpreting, and using eye tracking uh, in that setting. Because as I mentioned, it's very difficult to compare face-to-face -face with remote using eye tracking, um, very, very problematic in experimental sense. So here I focus on the eye tracking component of the project, looking at uh, a live remotely interpreted and um, simulated forensic police interview. And the questions that we are looking at are, are there differences in consecutive and simultaneous modes in this remote interpreting context? What about audio and video conditions? And what can we learn about the distribution of visual attention um, of the interpreters? So let's get um, into looking at the experiment in more detail. So in this part of the study, we had 50 um, interpreters, not such a good um, split in terms of language pairs. Um, Interestingly, I'll, I'll let you in on a little sneak preview. There were no differences between languages, even when we accounted for the uneven sample sizes as best we could. I'll, I'll talk to you about that in the limitations. Um, but we had 50, a sample of 50 um, professionally accredited interpreters, most of whom had both professional accreditation and uh, a formal qualification and experience working in remote interpretation. Of course, uh, alongside um, institutional requirements for working with human participants, we secured ethics approval and uh, all of the professional interpreters were remunerated at uh, the appropriate rate for their time. We used a within design, within participant design um, in this component to compare cognitive load and performance in these different consecutive and simultaneous modes of remote interpreting. All of the interviews, and I'll show you some screenshots, it'll be easier to see in just a moment. All of the interviews were held individually um, at a, a, an interview facility here in Sydney, in the city. And essentially we had an interview room for the interview who is an FBI agent, English speaking, and then the non-English speaking suspect in the different languages. Then, so, so the interviewer and the suspect together in the same room. In a separate room, but they can't hear or see each other, it's a different side of the, the facility, we have the interpreter who is um, viewing the interview on a computer screen using Zoom actually, just like we're using now, um, on a standard computer screen with one of these um, eye trackers attached to the bottom of it. Um, participants completed um, what we argue is a realistic simulated interview um, based on a range of authentic interviews from previous work. Um, the, the interview was constructed. I'll tell you a little bit more about the, the script in, in just a moment. But essentially, we have the English-speaking interviewer and the suspect who doesn't speak English. So the English-speaking interviewer is a constant across all of the languages. You'll, you'll see him a little bit later, whereas the suspect is, speak, is different uh, for the different language pairs. Interpretation mode simultaneous or consecutive was systematically varied within each interview session so that each participant completed one half of the interview in each mode. So some would have start with simultaneous, move to consecutive, others the other way around. Um, the interviews um, use Zoom, the interviewer, or the interpreters use Zoom for the interview, as I said, in full screen, nothing else open on the uh, computer. So we were able to set it up in such a way and to avoid any distractions or uh, notifications or a clock popping up on the bottom of the screen and disrupting our experiment. Um, so essentially a very clean setup in, in Zoom. 
The materials, um, a script of approximately 2,000 words, and remember half is consecutive, half is, interpret is, is simultaneous in English based on actual interviews. It was reviewed by authentic police officers to ensure the plausibility and the kind of ecological validity of it, and then translated by professional translators um, along the same demographic with certification and a postgraduate degree in translation and interpreting. We had a source language of English, and then the translations into the three language pairs, Arabic, Mandarin, Chinese, and Spanish. The scripts were then independently checked and edited by a second translator um, with the same credentials and piloted before being used in the experiment. This sounds all very laborious, but the, the materials part is really, really important in terms of um, identifying and controlling many of those factors I, I talked about earlier around word frequency, density, and so on. Um, the, the interviewer and the suspect are professionally trained actors um, to ensure consistent performance and the, this ecological validity. Um, the interpretation that was produced was then coded by two trained coders in each language pair, again, with the accreditation and um, postgraduate experience, qualifications and experiences. And then we used a set of performance criteria um, widely used in professional interpretation exams here in Australia and substantiated in previous research. I'll talk a little more about that later um, as well. So essentially, we have um, these dimensions of interpreting performance, the accuracy of the propositional content, accuracy of style, maintenance of the of verbal rapport markers, use of interpretation protocols, use of legal discourse and terminology, management and coordination skills, and language competence. And this is a, a, a rating that, um, that Hale and others had validated in earlier work in the project around the, um, the weighting, you can see the percentages here, and also establishing the inter-rater reliability, 0.85. Um, and then if we had instances where the two coders didn't agree as standard practice, we used a third independent coder. This is the eye tracker we used uh, specifically at Toby X260, um, so 60 hertz of temporal resolution. Uh, we used a nine point calibration for each participant. So this is when we follow a dot as it go around, goes around the screen, essentially to adapt to our individual differences. And, and, it, and when we um, had a break or um, split between modes, we had the calibration again to ensure the quality of the recording was consistent. Um, we then have a manual inspection and applied uh, the standard Toby IVT fixation filter to filter out the raw data. These sort of saccadic movements that you that I mentioned before, um, essentially we're interested in the, the fixations, their durations, and so on. We created what are known as areas of interest or AOIs around the full screen, and I'll show you some pictures. It'll be easier to see in just a moment. And the two participants, the interviewer and the suspect, as seen by the interpreter on their screen. Um, we used pretty standard measures in, in eye tracking, which are fixation count. So those red dots on the screen, when we fixate on something, a hand, a face, the duration. So it's duration in milliseconds, shifts of visual attention. So when we move, let's say, between the interviewer and the suspect or between the screen and our notes, um, these are shifts of uh, overt visual attention. And then two measures of cognitive load, which are very well established in the literature, not just in interpreting and translation, but also in language processing more generally. And those are percentage change in pupil dilation, the size of our pupil in millimeters as it gets larger and smaller, um, and blink rate, as the, the, the rate um, in which we're, uh, at which we're blinking. Um, we use two, I'll describe a little later because one, um, they, they they tell us a little bit a, a little bit of um, they show interesting dimensions of the same language process. Uh, I'll speak to that a little bit later as to why we use two. Um, but essentially, both have to be individually baselined because um, we have a short task at the beginning of each task where we can get a standard baseline of that participant's pupil size and blink rate and take that into account to have this individually baselined measure throughout. Um, it's a standard practice in, in eye tracking research. And then we have interpreting performance as a whole and those um, um, subcomponents as a covariate in all our statistical analyses. Um, so just to give you an idea of what it looks like, 
Um, so this is what the interpreter sees. So we're seeing now exactly what the interpreter sees on the screen. So in A here, we have just um, an example of these fixations, these green dots this time on the screen. You might see the lines between them, those saccades. You might see the numbers on the fixations telling you the sequence of those. You can see the suspect here on the left and the interviewer here on the right. Um, looking back, so this was uh, several years ago, it's not socially distant. So um, this, this was way before we had to worry about such things. Um, and this is essentially what the interpreter sees. Um, on the right-hand side, simultaneous, um, quite different, and I'll explain why it's so different in, in just a moment, shows the same thing. Um, and I really like this, this, um, this image is from the same participant when they worked in the consecutive mode here on the left, not so many fixations, um, more on the interviewer than the suspect. Um, and then in the simultaneous mode, it's a little bit more mixed, lots of visual attention on the screen. And this will really um, be an appetizer to the, the types of uh, results we have. So in terms of gaze time, so um, looking on the screen or, and fixating saccadic movements on the screen, um, we see significant differences between the modes. So on total gaze time, we see that the consecutive mode was significantly lower. And many of you might be saying, well, obviously, Stephen, they're looking away to take notes. Um, so that's an important factor, right? Um, consecutive mode has note taking um, and looking away from the screen. So we take that into account in all of the analyses later on, obviously, and to, to make sure it's a comparing like with like rather than disproportionate. Um, and when we take that into account, mean fixation count um, for the consecutive mode is higher. So more fixations relative to this gaze time. The mean fixation duration for the consecutive mode is higher. So there are longer fixations. And the shifts between um, the shifts of overt visual attention between the interviewer and the suspect um, were also higher in the consecutive mode. So all of the scary stats aside, this is telling us that simultaneous had more visual attention on the screen than consecutive, because in consecutive, there was a lot of time spent off screen looking at notes. And even when we take that into account, consecutive then um, had more fixations that were longer and more shifts of attention. What that could mean, I'll tell you in just a moment. This might help if you'd like to see visuals instead. Um, so again, relative to gaze time on the screen, simultaneous, um, uh, simultaneous mode had higher gaze time than consecutive, as we've mentioned. And then when we take that into account, fixation count, uh, duration, and shifts of attention are higher for consecutive. Um, so the lower the gaze time in the consecutive mode can be accounted for the participants engaging in note taking. This is something well established. And um, Chen 2016 has a really good overview of that um, in terms of eye tracking and note taking um, using a tablet and glasses, really interesting research and, and findings. Um, and also um, just to, to emphasize that point that we use relative gaze time afterwards. Interestingly, we did look at not using relative gaze time. Um, it it didn't, didn't make a difference really, but the, the, the most appropriate point is to use relative gaze time um, from there on. Looking at the distribution of visual attention, we saw that the interviewer, so let me go back here, the person here on the right, so the interviewer asking the questions, and the suspect here on the left. The interviewer was the same in all um, conditions, he spoke English. The suspect is different depending on the language condition. So the interviewer um, had longer gaze time on the interview, higher fixation count, and this is in both conditions, longer average fixation duration and more shifts of, of visual attention to the interviewer and from the interviewer to somewhere else. So that's basically all telling us that the interviewer attracted a lot more of the interpreter's visual attention on the screen. When we look at the difference between modes, we see that in the consecutive mode, um, shorter fixation time, higher fixation count, longer duration, the same pattern of results as we saw before. So this is telling us that um, interviewer attracted more visual attention than the suspect. Um, and we see the same pattern overall and um, that we saw previously, when, even when we split the screen in two, in terms of consecutive looking off screen and engaging in that note taking. Here's just another visualization of, of the heat map. And um, so the, the, the red color shows more fixation and then it dissipates as it goes out to yellow. 
and green, you can see unsurprisingly our physiological predispositions came into play when we look at hands and faces. We spend most of our day, well, many of us are academics, we spend most of our day looking at emails and text, but in outside of uh, emails and text, we spend a lot of our time looking at hands and faces uh, as we communicate and process language. It's just another visualization as an example to give you um, a little bit more context. So in terms of percentage change pupil dilation, so as I mentioned, this was individually baseline. We saw a significantly higher percentage change pupil dilation in the video condition than in the audio and in the consecutive mode than in the simultaneous. So pupil dilation, an indicator of cognitive load, appears higher in video than audio and higher in consecutive than in simultaneous. In both modes, though, the interviewer was associated with significantly higher percentage change pupil dilation than the suspect. So pretty much the same thing as we saw before. Um, more visual attention on the interviewer than the suspect, more cognitive load um, when processing the interviewer's speech than the suspect. Another interesting aspect um, is that uh, we then looked at the interpretation in, in four blocks of time. And we see that percentage change pupil dilation increases over time, unsurprisingly, right? Task, this is very common in any task, particularly in language tasks, that the cognitive load has a cumulative effect. It builds over time. Um, but interestingly, we see this rate of building is higher in the consecutive mode than in simultaneous. So the cognitive load is higher in consecutive um, as, as, in, as indexed by percentage change in pupil dilation than in simultaneous. And whereas there was no difference here between the audio and video conditions. So basically, all of this is telling us that per, per percentage change in pupil dilation or pupil size, um, higher in the video than the audio, higher in consecutive, more cognitive load on the interviewer, and more cognitive load over time, particularly in the consecutive mode. We see exactly the same thing as blink rate. So blink rate and percentage change pupil dilation are um, correlates. They, they, they always correlate with each other. In tasks like this, we see exactly the same thing. So um, higher blink rate in the video than in the audio, higher blink rate in consecutive than in um, simultaneous, more blinking on the um, interpreter, and they're not winking at anybody, um, than the suspect and the blink rate increased in each block of time, particularly in the consecutive mode. So pretty much the same thing, well, not pretty much, exactly the same thing as we saw with percentage change pupil dilation. A visualization might help a little bit here of the same data where we see the blink rate here in orange, the percentage change pupil dilation in purple, and we see those being higher in the consecutive condition um, relative to gaze time. And then the same thing with audio and video. Um, in the blink rate and the pupil diameter. So what's also interesting is to look at the correlations of all of the variables we have here and, and try to build a model out of all of this wonderful data that we have. Um, obviously, we've only got 50 participants and uneven um, language pairs of three languages, but it's a start. Um, Percentage change in pupil dilation and blink rate, as I've mentioned, uh, are, are established indicators of cognitive load, but they represent different stages of the information and processing kind of framework. Blinks are more reliable indicators of early processing of, in this case, the language data and the visual information on the screen, whereas pupil dilation better reflects sustained processing. But interestingly, we didn't see differences um, both measures um, found the same thing both over time and at the individual time points we looked at. Um, you might be able to see in, in probably a little smaller text than I should have at the bottom of the screen, we look at correlation coefficients of all of these variables and highlighted here in red are, are the ones that um, I'll speak to because they're some of the most interesting findings. We see here that cognitive load significantly correlates with accuracy rapport and management, the, these subcomponents of interpreting performance. Um, also of interest is that we have a self-report cognitive load um, item on a questionnaire where the participants were asked after each mode to self-report the cognitive load of that mode. Um, 
And that only correlated with management and competence, not so with the other measures of interpreting performance and not so with percentage change pupil dilation or blink rate. So there's a definite mismatch here between the interpreter's perception of cognitive load and what the eye movements tell us about the cognitive load, um, which I think is very interesting and, and worthy of further discussion. We also see these, these expected correlations between subcomponents of interpreting performance, which you know all should be correlated with each other as they've been established um, as a standard measure in previous work. And just to spend a little bit more time on the correlations as well, um, we looked at the um, fixation count duration and, and all of those measures as well, um, at the same um, measures of interpreting performance. And we see that once again, rapport, accuracy, and management were um, really interesting factors here. Um, each of the eye tracking measures below correlated with the interpreting performance. Accuracy had the, high, the strongest correlation with gaze time, and then rapport and management with shifts of visual attention. So enough of the jargon, Stephen, what is this actually telling us? The longer we fixate or the interpreters fixated on the speakers, the more accurate their interpretation was. The more the interpreters shifted their visual attention between the speakers, the better the rapport and the management scores. So essentially, and, and this, this makes everything sound so trivial, essentially pay attention and look at what's happening on the screen and we'll be able to process that language better. Um, now, I, 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 I kid, it's much more complicated than that, but that is the gist of it. Um, so overall, we see relative to performance, Consecutive had significantly less gaze time on screen, which of course means less visual attention on the screen due to the off-screen note-taking activities. But even when we take that into account, participants in both modes allocated significantly more visual attention and consequently cognitive load on the interviewer, the participant on the right of the screen, than the suspect on the left. And again, relative to the time on the screen, so we can compare like with like, consecutive resulted in significantly more and longer fixations, more shifts of attention between parties, and then more shifts of attention on and off the screen, just as I'm doing now, looking at my notepad, looking at the screen, looking at the interviewer, looking at the suspect, back to my notepad. Very busy work um, doing all of that, really, really complex. Um, and also then significantly higher pupil dilation and blink rate, indicative of greater cognitive load um, from this perspective. The um, video also appeared more demanding um, in terms of cognitive load than audio, percentage change in pupil dilation and blink rate were higher, but this is a limitation of eye tracking. The luminosity of video um, had essentially stimulates the, the pupil, right? So um, pupil, uh, pupil reactions uh, generally occur because of you know, light, physical aspects in the environment, a cognitive aspect, or an emotional, emotive, or affective response. Um, and this is a limitation there. So it's, it's um, interesting to note, but that's a, a big limitation here. Whereas audio, they're looking at a blank screen, video, they're seeing the screen, the, the screenshots you saw there. So that may explain why the video appeared to be more cognitively demanding, not necessarily a representation of higher cognitive load, but just the pupil's reaction to the uh, luminosity of the screen in the video condition. This is something uh, noted quite a lot in audiovisual translation, for instance. Um, the interesting, the interesting parts uh, I find more towards the end, and, and this is where I'll pick up for the couple of slides, I'll talk about the next steps. The cognitive load having this um, cumulative increase over time was very, very interesting. Um, the, the effect sizes were really significant here, um, particularly in the consecutive mode. And um, so basically the task is becoming more and more difficult over time, and it will be interesting to explore that further. Um, also, this mismatch between the self-report measure of cognitive load and the online measures is very interesting. So the interpreters didn't rate the cognitive load um, in the way that we measured it using these measures. So there's quite a, a mismatch there between that. And also the self-reported cognitive load uh, of the participants didn't match most of the indicators of interpreting performance. So there's a, an interesting, maybe a cognitive blindness there and um, that we could explore a little bit more. The correlations between the eye checking measures, cognitive load and interpreting performance 
are quite interesting to move uh, forward, particularly the accuracy, the rapport and management, where, as I said, more visual attention on the speaker equals better performance. And as I said, we have no significant differences between the three language pairs tested, um, even when we do our best statistically to control for the uneven sample sizes um, as best we can, but not ideal, of course. So in terms of discussion, and this is some food for thought, and hopefully it'll come up in our, in our Q&A, um, essentially the a limitation here, you could say, is that, well, is because we're looking at eye tracking measures, is consecutive necessarily more demanding or is it just a visual attention issue? So this reorientation after looking back to the screen leads to more and longer fixations. And then as we operationalize cognitive load, higher cognitive load. Um, that's why it was interesting to, to um, look at performance as well. Um, clearly, the cognitive processing is taking place on screen and off screen. So even when an interpreters in the consecutive mode are taking notes and looking at their, um, at their notes, they're still listening, right? And this is a limitation of overt visual attention with eye tracking. So there's a lot more going on than just the fixations, right? There's a whole uh, auditory process happening. Um, but in, in the sense of how we've narrowly operationalized cognitive load here, simultaneous mode appears more optimal for remote interpreting, at least in an investigative interview uh, scenario, where aspects like rapport, and uh, maintenance, and management are um, really key to interpreting performance. Um, but in a nutshell, maximizing our input of this auditory and visual information um, really leads to improved performance. And we could see this not just in terms of overall performance, but in terms of how the interpreters um, attribute, uh, attributed more attention and cognitive load to the interviewer over the suspect. The cumulative cognitive load, as I said, is, is a very interesting finding and something I'm, I'm following up in another project. Um, as it increased over time, particularly in the consecutive mode. So what does this tell us about um, how long we should be interpreting in the remote um, context, um, lengthy interviews, breaks, and so on? So there are some implications here that I think will be interesting to discuss for uh, training and, and professional conditions and so on. And uh, I'll, I'll, this is something that I think I'm, I'm excited to discuss, hopefully, in the, uh, in the Q&A, a project. So I got some funding in a fellowship um, for um, looking at uh, a follow-up of this, and I'm focusing in on the temporal aspect of it. So I just started this month, so you've got to give me a break. Um, and I'm focusing on the temporal aspects, because I think this is a really, really interesting aspect of the data that kept keep coming up over and over again, not just the visual attention and the cognitive load, but also the interpreting performance over time. Um, and we can use um, quite robust statistical methods to look at individual and group based differences and how they function over time and um, linear mixed effects modeling. And rather than removing or controlling for it in the experiment, we can actually collect you know, more real world data um, with different types of text, different types of tasks and identify in a more authentic way um, at which point or points, if any, does um, cognitive load result in overload? And does that always result in lack uh, reduction in interpreting performance? Because sometimes we compensate. Even when we're reading, you know, we compensate almost automatically when we see typos on the page, right? And so the interpretation um, analogy of this is that we're always, interpreters are always um, accounting for mistakes in the, in the source, adjusting for this variety of factors. So I'm really interested to explore that um, in further detail, looking at these statistical methods, um, because the individual differences and the, the task-based differences over time, I think are really compelling. Um, so then identifying, building on the work in the first project, where we looked at those features and, and how they correlate, and um, using machine learning to identify these features and a software plugin that we have um, kind of a rough draft of in Zoom, where we can look at essentially um, an indicator of dipping performance or increased cognitive load. Um, so that's the, the, the kind of grand ambition for the next few months of this project. 
And the guiding questions really are, what's the optimal duration for um, remote interpreting relative to performance and indeed to mode? And what's the optimal period of recovery? And there's some really interesting literature in the uh, cognitive load space around uh, learning. And they look at children learning, adults learning, vocab, and um, math test performance and so on. And they have some really interesting findings like um, a five minute break looking at a green screen is much more effective than a 15 minute break just kind of wandering in the corridor. And, and I think there's some really interesting ways in which this, this literature on cognitive load could really be useful, um, not just in terms of our conceptual and, and modeling, uh, conceptual understanding of modeling of interpreting, but also in professional practice in an area where um, you know, the risks are, are so significant and growing, um, and particularly to have more of an evidence base to guide um, best practice and, and policy um, from different stakeholder perspectives. Um, so in line with that, then, what sort of individual and task-based features can we learn in a machine learning um, sense of the word uh, learn? And could we um, feed this into a software plugin and would it be useful in practice? Um, some of you might remember a few years ago, Volvo used eye tracking in their cars and they had it on the dashboard. And this is a very simplistic application of what I think might, might work and this project might look like. And basically they would say to the driver, you're drowsy. We can tell from your eye movements, you're drowsy, take a break. Um, so a more sophisticated version of that, um, I think is, is something that we're aiming for and, and how that might be useful. And I will be interested, interested to hear your thoughts as well, not just on the, the findings of the first study, but also where to from here and is, is, is it worth exploring an application of this? So essentially the idea around um, having something more objective in, in, in professional practice, because it's easy to say, um, or in many cases for interpreters, it's not easy to say, I need a break or um, my performance is dipping or I need to swap with somebody else because from what we see in, in these legal and forensic scenarios, that's just not an option. Um, and, and that can be really, really problematic. Whereas if there's something there to prompt or say, you know, we're at this kind of minimum threshold of performance, um, you have to stop. Um, I think that's a really interesting avenue to explore in terms of professional practice um, and in our modeling of it. Um, so the, there are a couple of articles um, currently under review for the first project that I'll upload here to the research gate, but the references that I mentioned before and the paper, the Hale, Hale and others paper on the interpreting performance and the, the validation of um, how we measured interpreting performance can be found there. And of course, always going back to my nerdy roots, we have thank you and um, thanks so much for your patience over quite a long time. I, I really enjoyed this project, so I'm happy to talk about it for hours on end, even though I'm probably inducing quite a lot of cognitive load on Zoom as we, as we speak. But I'm happy now to hopefully answer some questions and discuss a little bit further. I'll just turn off my screen. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Um, I think for those of us who might have found it difficult to sit here at nine o'clock in the morning in the UK, I would say it was uh, more than what I was getting up for. <laughs> so, Good, thank thanks. you. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> yes. and um, We can put that on the paper. Worth getting up for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the paper title. Eh? Um, so thank you very much for this uh, really interesting and insightful talk. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, you see my cognitive. Did you eye track us? <laughs> no. um, okay, I will. Uh, I will open this uh, up for questions. We see in the chat at the moment we are we seeing lots of uh, nice messages to you, but uh, yes, um, questions, please. Oh, I'm getting uh, messages from all sides here. Well, um, I can't. Uh, I we yes. have a question uh, in the in the chat. So okay. I don't know. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Juan, uh, Jean, Juan, you. I don't yes, know if you want okay. to ask a question yes. or slide it. I can't see. Dear Stephen, uh, yeah. So thank you for your impressive talk. I have a question regarding eye tracking measures. I noticed that you used uh, various measures such as fixation count and total fixation duration. Uh, what uh, if we yield significant uh, p-values with fixation durations as dv 
whereas um, we fail to yield non-significant results using fixation count as Stevie. Um, Stephen, I think you better want to read this <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Should... No, that's, so it's, it's, it's asking about um, essentially, you know, why use all of these different metrics? Yes. What's the best way to analyze them and, and so on? This is something that, that comes up. Yeah. Um, the short, there's a short answer. There's a cheeky short answer and a, and a better long answer. And the cheeky short answer is because they're there and we can, and they're, they're all really interesting and tell us lots of different things. Um, but the better long answer is um, they tell us different things about the process that we're interested in. Um, so you might have seen, um, and, and I, I mentioned it a few times, that, for instance, um, the the blink rate is more this initial processing of information or stimuli input and the um, pupil, di pupil dilation then sustained processing over time. You see in the language processing literature, um, things like the early fixation duration, look at lexical access, um, second fixation duration and, and third and, and so on, looking at syntax, for instance. So it really depends on, on what it is that you're interested in, um, which measures will tell you different things about it. And we'll, we'll, we spell this out a lot more in, in the paper. Um, but all of those measures are there and they typically correlate quite significantly with each other um, over and over again in these kinds of tasks. However, there are some language tasks and, and other tasks as well that aren't related to language where they don't necessarily correlate. And, and it's because there, there's, there are different things happening and that these measures tell you different things about it. Um, so you see people looking at them in isolation. Um, for instance, looking at uh, um, t-tests and ovas you see them um looking in models um really the the, the we're, we're catching up in translation and interpreting but if you look at it in, in cognitive science cognitive psychology psycholinguistics they tend to use mix, mixed effect models um and that's really um a really neat and robust way to control for all of these factors in in a more robust just, just statistical manner um and i think by looking at the variables in isolation and what they're actually measuring in your study versus looking at them together um, will help you understand or at least uh, clarify where that inconsistency could be. It could be in the measurement, it could be in some sort of quality of the recording, or it could be in the task that you're actually interested in and, and the different parts of that task as, as you break it up in a cognitive perspective. So I, I hope that helps. Um, send me an email if that didn't make any sense and I can, I am happy to, to look and, and do that. Um, there's a, I had a paper, uh, um, I'll, I'll, I can put it in, or if you send me an email, I can send you a paper where um, I talk about the differences looking at um, kind of traditional ANOVAs and multivariate analyses versus mixed effect modeling. And um, so that might be useful as well. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I think we have a few more questions. Demi, um, fire away. Yes. Hi, Stephen. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry, I cannot really switch on my camera as I'm in the process yep, of traveling, so I want to spare you that view. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, one you. of the findings that stood out for me and I can relate to uh, is the fact that the, the um, interviewer attracted more attention than the suspect, as you said. Mm. Uh, this is a fantastic finding, um, and as I said, something that I can relate to, because what we found in our own research in healthcare settings, obviously, we did not have the, um, the um, sophisticated eye-tracking, um, you know, uh, gear that you guys had, but in a rather more simplistic way, if you like, we found something similar, namely that the interpreter was focusing much more on the healthcare professional, uh, the doctor in that case, instead of the patient. And because that study happened within the framework of uh, empathic communication, what we found is that um, because the interpreter was focusing more on the doctor than on the patient, uh, this had an effect on the way in which empathic communication was co-constructed, meaning that um, the interpreter missed certain empathic cues from the patient side, because they focused much more on the uh, non-verbals and uh, you know, a body language, if you like, of the healthcare provider. So what we did afterwards is we went back to all of the participants and we interviewed them 
uh, by means of a, a stimulated video recall uh, mm -hmm. method. And what they told us, and actually I wanted to check with you whether you have similar insights. What they told us is that um, the interpreter felt more inclined to look at the healthcare professional than the patient because they thought that they are the ones uh, taking the lead in the medical interview. So they wanted to make sure that they do not really miss any, anything important. That's how they phrased it. So our understanding is that this would obviously have implications for interpreter training, and you touched upon that uh, in your presentation. And we thought that this might also relate to implicit bias. Uh, we know from the literature that uh, there is power asymmetry also in legal settings as well as in healthcare settings. So maybe, this is a question to you, uh, maybe um, we may want to consider drawing attention to the, uh, to, to, to the power, if you like, of implicit bias on the way in which interpreters manage their gaze, right? And the way this can affect um, essential parts in the interactional process, empathy being just one of them. So do you have similar insights, Stephen? And apologies for this very, very long um, question. Thank you. No, oh, thank you so much. That's so, so interesting. I'm rapidly taking notes as, as, as you were speaking. So um, I'm, I'm proving my own point as we go through it. And this is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing it. And, and I really, we talk about it a lot more in the paper and there's a lot more to go in that. Um, we didn't interview our participants to that extent afterwards. It would be, in hindsight now, I'm thinking, oh, so obvious, it would have been good. It would have been fantastic to share with them the gaze replay of their, of their eye tracking and ask them about it in this sort of retrospective think aloud protocol kind of manner, or even use the recordings as training material to kind of see, look, you know, you ignore the, the a nicer way of saying, you didn't spend as much visual attention on the, on the patient in your context or in the suspect in my context, and, and you miss these visual um, or these nonverbal um, cues. I think that's really, really interesting. Um, we, a couple of things from, from, from the, the, this study, it could have been that the, um, the, I guess the, the interviewer that the, the FBI agent um, had that kind of the, this sort of power dynamic status is there. Um, I, I think that's, that's an interesting point about implicit bias or we're more likely to, you know, listen to or attend to the doctor or the, the, the policeman than the suspect or the patient for exactly the reasons that you mentioned, because they're more likely to take the lead or being seen as knowing what's going on and so on. So I definitely think there's a whole social kind of psychosocial element here. That's really, really interesting. Um, one of the comments there was around, um, I saw related to this, and um, just trying to keep about, well, did, the, did, did they speak for different durations? So this held, um, I didn't mention it in it, but we controlled for the length of the utterances between the two speakers and it was and the, the result held. So even when we controlled for the fact that the, um, in, in my context, the interviewer spoke um, a little longer, not, not actually significantly longer, but a little longer than the suspect. It was, it was quite even deliberately. That's how we designed the script. Um, the, the duration of the utterance didn't matter. So even when we take that duration into account, the, the, the time speaking on the screen, um, the interviewer attracted more of that visual attention. And um, thanks so much for mentioning that paper. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. And because I really think that's an interesting part and particularly for training, as you say, and I think these um, these materials. I'm just thinking thinking out loud now that the, the actual recordings would be really, really interesting. Um, comparing it to something completely different. In the automotive industry, they put eye tracking glasses on expert uh, quality assurance people. So there's a robot coming down the conveyor belt or a car, and they have these experts with like 20 years of experience, and they look at where those people look and they use that to train new people coming in. So I think that's a really, really interesting avenue in terms of um, practice and implications. Thanks so much. Um, Claudia, I know you have a question. I would just like to also make a comment on that. Um, we, uh, uh, you can even go further with that. So in, in 
our remote interpreting study on the uh, which was also on the investigative interviews of course as you know um we also it was more discourse analytic in many parts and mm -hmm. we also noticed that um you know even in remote interpreting and even though it was a simulation like yours the interpreters also discursively of course treated the participants differently so mm -hmm. there was a lot more politeness marcus for example when when addressing the police officer so so that goes in the direction of what you were just mentioning with all the social dimensions that that mm -hmm. come in there as well so i think we should um, maybe we could carve out a larger project there as a follow up to 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 look at that uh, mm -hmm. with all our different perspectives that would Absolutely. actually be very really interesting. Really interesting yeah also with and, your and there, and Andrea just added a comment, I think, yep. that uh, would, would tag on to yours, Sabina, there about, you know, the interpreter being hired by, typically by of course, yeah, know, that's, the, the, um, yes. the doctor or the interviewer yes. and so on. In yeah. our context, they had no um, relationship with either party. You know, we, we hired them, so to speak, and, and they were presented with that, which kind of shows that ev even in that sort of setting, they still then attributed, this is the interviewer. Exactly. It would be interesting to, to, to not to not uh, tell them who the interviewer and the suspect were, but they'd figure it out. Yeah, well, they would figure that. Yeah. But we um, we did that too, of course, for the simulations. I mean, this was very similar. And um, uh, of course you hire them, but in, in our follow-up interviews that we did with them also, they, they actually referred to those things that uh, they also referred to it in the court context, giving these examples, you know, that they, that they wouldn't want to step on the wrong side of a judge. So they actually made it explicit. They compared the, you know, we also asked them how, how realistic felt the simulation for you so, so they they came up with all these things comparing this with a real scenario so they were I think our interpreters were very experienced police interpreters and legal interpreters so they they brought in a lot of their own experience and I think to some extent some of these things were so automated so to speak and uh, that uh, they couldn't let them go even in the simulation which of course was interesting because it made our simulation more realistic in a way you know and really I also found it interesting things, yeah right? yeah that you try to counterbalance the uh, or balance rather the um the amount of talking because our experience was that uh, I mean okay we simulated it as well but when you extrapolate from these simulations I mean in a police interview people are good storytellers they can so that's not necessarily something I guess you know we can go by they have to live with however long the turns are and uh, some people yeah. can be very talkative but and, and, okay and sorry I, yeah, yeah. No, I was just going to say, and, and that, that's obviously this, there's no perfect solution to that, that we used an authentic script as best we could versus yeah. creating our own and, you know, benefits, pros and cons on the other. Yeah. No, we did the same. We, we, um, we based it on an authentic script and then you adapted. So. I'm sorry, but I don't want to dominate this because I think, uh, Claudio, you had a question, although... Um, yes, I can. Hello. Hello. <laughs> again. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi, again. Yes. Hi, Stefan. Thank you very much for this Hi. very, very interesting talk. I, I, I want to shift with my question a bit a little the focus on the technological part. Um, and I was wondering if you have considered in some way or you consider interesting to be considered in future, the role of the user interface on the one side. So, for example, the different la possible layouts you can have about uh, the, the, the visual information on the screen as uh, an element that can influence this cognitive load on the one side in both consecutive and simultaneous, and also the distribution of attention that you, uh, you, you very interesting uh, measured here. So different settings from uh, the UI perspective, but also different um, quality of the audio. If also the quality, different quality of the audios that you can eventually also simulate uh, may impact in some way or not impact, and this is the question, um, both the cognitive load and uh, this um, attention distribution. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, really good points. The second one first, the audio, that, that would be really fantastic. And the, I've seen it in monolingual studies where they reduce the audio quality or the distance um, to see the impact of that. And that would be a really interesting um, aspect. We did not all look at it here. Um, it works in the same way, in, in much the same way as we compensate for errors in written text and written languages we come in, in that um, some types of errors we can compensate for and others I think will have a detrimental impact. And also the, the, the kind of moderating relationship between cognitive load and performance comes into play that increased cognitive load, load doesn't necessarily mean decreased performance, right? Because we can compensate in, in, in many ways for that. 
or the increased cognitive load might be indicative of the person trying to, in, in, in cognitive load theory, it's called spatiotemporal integration, um, so compensate for that disparity. Um, on the UI bit, uh, this is really with that the second part of this project too that I, that I talked about, getting into that a lot more, I think would be really, really interesting. And from what we know, again, drawing on this cognitive load theory, and I've used it in, in uh, AVT work, if, if, if stimuli appear closer in, in space and in time, it enables this, this multi it's called multi-sensory integration or um, spatiotemporal integration. It reduces the extra cognitive load. Um, and this is an issue with, you know, with, with captions and subtitles, but also a really interesting issue that comes into play here that if we're looking at the person as they're speaking, the cognitive load is less. If I'm taking notes, uh, or even if I'm just looking away and not doing anything as the person speaking, it's higher cognitive load because I'm trying to compensate for that, or I just might miss some of that information. I certainly think that the UI could really, really help reduce this, again, using the cognitive load um, terminology, I sound like a zealot, but it's a really interesting framework. And um, if we can reduce that space and time, literally between all of the information coming in, you, you would in theory, reduce the cognitive load of the input and improve the performance. So absolutely, I, I think there's a lot to be done there. Uh, and I guess one of the, this idea of having this pop-up I, I think is, is kind of this early idea of, of how could we start doing that kind of thing, um, both from the user perspective, but also from, um, in, you know, in, in, in my context here, the interviewer or something there of, of having something that's, that's objectively indicating that load is too high or performance is too low or you're at risk of this, particularly, as we just mentioned, these social factors. And because we know in many situations, I'm not going to tell a judge to, to take a break for a minute while I while I get my thoughts <laughs> together and catch up. Whereas if there's this impersonal pop up um, or, or something like that, you know, you can tell I have it's, a, it's an early thought. And um, but I absolutely think that the more and more we go with that and think of translation memories. Right. And, and the impact of the user interface on that process. Um, of course, the 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 same would would have an impact on the cognitive load and um, in, inter in remote interpreting. Yeah, really interesting. There's another question that I, I think I just skipped earlier on about the, the effect sizes, the, the partial out of squares and all of that. I, I'm, I'll include, those are in the paper. I didn't, um, I didn't want to bore everybody with all of my stats. Um, <laughs> so those are there, don't worry, and, and your squares. So the ones that I presented were, were significant, um, but the for absolutely, it's important for replication studies, you know, they will be in the, in the papers um, when they're published um, soon, I hope. Okay. Do we have any other? I mean, I have, is I there anything else? Can... Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Very interesting talk. And I was wondering um, what happens if uh, uh, the interviewer and interviewee are in different locations? So, do you have any thoughts how the results would change um, if you would have three Zoom um, uh, link? Uh, leaving, let's let's in order to make things simple. Let's assume that the quality of the image and sound are good enough to replicate um, uh, a face-to-face -face meeting. But I wonder what would happen in terms of uh, um, all this this uh, eye tracking interaction. Any thoughts on that? And also uh, the, the, the interface. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think you've just proposed project C or project three out of that because that's then more the reality because this. As I said before, th this took place several years ago um, before COVID. And this was the typical scenario that was happening in these legal settings where the police officer or the interviewer and the suspect would be in this interview room. Um, and not sure where that interrogation room, but in this very purpose-built room and the interpreter would, would dial in, so to speak. But nowadays, at, at, you know, in, here in Sydney in lockdown, what you're describing is what's happening now where there, there are three people in three physical locations. And of course, again, um, what Claudio had mentioned about the UI is even more of, of an impact. So even repeating the same study and, and just changing that bit that the two of them are not in the same room, but rather in different physical locations would be really, really interesting. 
again, we would expect that the risk of the risks are amplified. The potential for risk is, is, is increased and um, things like the cognitive load and um, the uh, performance would, would come into play. But I'm just thinking in terms of um, even if you, if you think back to the slide that I showed the, the image on where we had the, the interviewer and the suspect on the screen, in a Zoom scenario, that would look the same, except they would probably, they wouldn't be looking at each other. They would be looking at the screen and there would be a line down the screen. So it actually, you know, it would be interesting. It might not have such an impact, but it's more, I, I think it would have more of an impact, not necessarily on what the interpreter is seeing on the screen, um, but more on the interaction between the, um, the interviewer and the suspect, because I think their interaction both verbal and nonverbal would be different if they were in two different locations versus together. Um, but yeah, really interesting. Thank you. Really worth exploring. Yeah, this is something that, um, you know, that's ironic. Um, long, long before the pandemic uh, in the early 2000s, that's, that was my PhD, this three-way video link. <laughs> and sort of very experimental, then I'm completely unpredictable what would happen sort of so many years later. But we did that experimentally um, for a dialogue setting. And we tried, um, so it was a job interview setting and nothing to do with legal. It was very experimental. Um, and we, we injected sort of simultaneous interpreting there. So it was, I think, the first study on this sort of simultaneous interpreting in a, in a three-way video link. And so the focus was on, I mean, the, 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 the sound quality was bad at the time. You can't really compare this with nowadays, of course. But the focus was on can the, to what extent the interpreters can adapt um, so what about their own performance? And then also the other point was, what about the coordination in this? And I mean, I, I don't want to, uh, it's published, obviously, I don't want to tell you the whole study, but what, what, what we found, there are so many different, if you like, configurations and uh, variations that I think from nowadays point of view, this is also something we are, we are looking at, of course, um, we would have to study them all step by step, you know, so who is visible to whom is the interpreter even visible in the simultaneous scenario, you know, would the interpreter be visible in the same manner than, uh, than in a consecutive scenario, um, or would the interpreter be smaller and, and, and all of this, and then, you know, then you also have to think around if it's consecutive or if it's simultaneous, and if it's simultaneous, how how is it switched and all of those things because we found at the time of course that was long before you had the simultaneous interpreting interfaces and all of that that it made a it was actually coordination wise for the interpreter quite a bit of additional work because these people they also overlapped because they sometimes understood each other so they also overlapped so the interpreter had to say it very um, sloppily a hell of a job into also coordinating the other people and trying to figure out when they overlap who do I prioritize when they speak? And, and, and so I think that is a much more complex scenario, but we have to look at that, of course, nowadays because of the mm -hmm. post-COVID. We also, by the way, we did um, retrospective thinking aloud at the time with those people. And uh, and uh, going back to the discussion that, that Claudio started earlier, you know, this um, I think this is another really important component to see without any aids on the screen, without anything, what the interpreters can compensate for, you know, by, I mean, we all know the limitations of thinking aloud as well. It's also only one method that can, but it can be added quite successfully in the mix. Mm. I could see at the time in my data how they really increased their inferencing what they explained to me afterwards, what they thought and what they didn't. It was mostly around not hearing properly at the time because the sound quality was so bad. But, you know, it doesn't, for the experiment, it doesn't really matter. We were interested in how they are compensating for what kind of strategies they use. And you can really see in the data how much they they inference when they said, oh, I couldn't really hear that word, but I knew from my preparation and from, you know, who was talking to whom that they did this and that they did that. And I had heard the question before. And from that question, I was extrapolating that this and this is meant. So they explained all of this to us in the thinking aloud data, which of course then also led me to think, yeah, no wonder that they find this tiring and that links to your cognitive load, for example, you know, all, all the things that are going on in their mind while they are doing that. And in the, uh, in the later study that we then did on the legal interpreting, we, we also saw like Barbara Moser Mercer and others that there is this fatigue setting in, 
um, in our case, you know, like 16, 17 minutes into the police interview, which isn't long compared to what interpreters are normally doing in police interviews. And uh, we can really see the drop in performance after that time. And, and we had these discussions with others thinking it's, it is actually unsurprising given what's, what's going on in their mind, basically. And I think your data, that's what I find so interesting is from the eye tracking perspective, they actually really corroborate um, and I hope you find more. <laughs> it would be interesting to see what you find in the in the temporal study yeah. to see whether we can shed more light on, you know, where does that fatigue set in, and is there anything more we can glean from this? And then, of course, this question is: there can, can we do anything to support this to counteract this uh, fatigue? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, I get carried away here, but that's very think, no, interesting. It's really, it's really yeah. good. You know, it, in an ideal world, we would have all of these experimental variables um, <laughs> <I know. laughs> all, all in one big giant study. No. Um, and, you know, it, it, that's something to, to dream for. Um, but I think it brings up a really interesting aspect that our discipline is particularly good at, right? Because now, you know, in a very scientific way, we would look at all of these things very individually and very systematically mm -hmm. in a very experimentally controlled way. Um, meanwhile, remote interpreting is, is, is just happening all over the place. And, and it, it, it's a really, I always find this sort of struggle between uh, professional practice and, and, and that kind of uh, high ecological validity kind of applied research mm -hmm. and the kind of really rigorous scientific aspect. And, and you know, I have colleagues working in, in, in cognitive science and psycholinguistics where they're, they kind of look at the script and think, you know, there are a billion variables here. What about this phoneme? And, you know, and it, it's a really always this interesting clash between um, looking at things in a very systematic way, ex especially when we look at the research that's happening monolingually and how... Mm. Um, in, in relative terms, basic that is to what is happening in, let's say, the context of, of remote interpreting, the bilingual, the multimodal, mm. yes, yes. the multitask, the technology factors, mm. the social mm. factors. There are so many um, confounds and, and issues and variables. Mm. But I guess, you know, we, we, we do need both. Um, we need the... Uh, uh, more observational studies in real settings now in the field, but we also need the, and I think now we are seeing, uh, Agnieszka, sorry, I know you are raising hand, um, now we are seeing more studies really in the last even couple of years, I mean yours and there are other groups now working on this, always a different focus, which is so interesting, and I think we can then also sort of begin to piece the puzzle together a little bit better yeah. but uh, yeah and you I, can't do all this in one study of course. and I think what's really exciting and is happening I think more in, in the next few years is I think that gap between the research that's happening in in the lab and the mm. research that's happening yes. in the field oh, is actually can really coming together and I think yes. that's quite exciting not yeah. just with the research methods and, and the technologies and all of that but it, but it, I think that's really exciting mm. in the mm. future so Agnieszka, I, I see you raise your hand and hello. Yeah, hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. Long, Long time, time no see, see. Sabine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. This is really fascinating. Thank you and good luck with your projects, especially the second one, which seems to be more, uh, even more ambitious than the first one. I just have a comment regarding your pupil dilation data. You, uh, you mentioned that one of the limitations you had was the difference in luminosity, right, between the video and the blank screen that they looked at. <laughs> So I think uh, one way of maybe trying to um, um, limit that limitation, so to say, would be to have them look at uh, maybe not a blank screen, but a screen that would be a static picture from the interview, maybe with pixelated, a little bit pixelated so that they don't look at the faces, right? But um, something like, uh, I think the, the, the frame was pretty static, right? So just a still picture pixelated so that the luminosity is similar, and then maybe that could uh, make your pupil dilation data uh, more um, um, reliable. Yeah, F That's fantastic it. suggestion. And, you know, these things are so kind of obvious in hindsight of, you know, that's an easy thing to do. I, I guess we we didn't really, we, we considered things like that and, and trying to find a, a color that best represented the scene, that it wasn't so different. Um, but I think the the overarching aim was always to kind of have it as authentic as possible. And and that's what they see. And, you know, it, it does create this confound in, in the in, in that comparison with that pupil and dilation data. But that's a fantastic suggestion. Thank you. Really, really makes sense.
Yeah, and you could also look at the gaze aversion data as, as well, right? Because yeah, I think yeah. if, if they had no video uh, stimuli, they looked around a bit more. And there are some gaze aversion studies as well that uh, um, yeah. might make this data useful. Thank you. Thank you. Really yes. interesting. Thank you very much. Great, uh, a great project. Okay. Um... I don't think there's any other thing, uh, other question in the chat that, uh, Atomic from you, was that a question or was it more of a comment? It, it was a question actually. Uh, ah, go on then. Um, yeah, go on. Come on. It, it was a question about a uh, performance measurement and, uh, and if you're thinking if you need on a new project uh, of tracking the temporal aspect, and I mean here, you know, interpreters when they perform, usually the performance varies across uh, the duration of the shift. So will you be interested also in the, uh, in the temporal aspect, in fragments of lower and higher performance, and then seeing how that relates to gaze and, and, and getting eye tracking data from, from those fragments? Thanks. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for that. And, and also looking at um, the impact on the task, right? So looking at um, you know, word frequency and those other factors, I think would be really, really interesting. I, I guess what would be really nice, like, like Sibine had mentioned a little earlier, would it be, would be really good to have a sort of a, a clean, it, it doesn't exist, right? But this sort of benchmark baseline here is the typical interpreting task performance cognitive load over time. Doesn't exist, right? But let's pretend that it does just for a moment. Um, and, and then to kind of add on all of those factors. And I think that's the, the really interesting, interesting bit. And um, a, a PhD student that I have with a colleague of mine, Professor Ludmilla Stern, is looking at, and um, she's not using eye tracking, but she's looking at the impact um, of, of these discrete changes in, in, the, in the text uh, in terms of the difficulty and the impact on cognitive load. Um, so, yeah, I think it will be really interesting to look um, it's, it's not going to, you know, I'm, I'm being silly by saying it, it's sort of like this. It's going to be very individually variant. It's going to differ, as you say, in, in returns and, and all of that. Um, so it would be a matter of, so the, the starting point really of all of this was looking at the, the temporal aspects of the data we had in the first study and, and really seeing this, this, you know, again, I'm using this kind of, uh, um, gesture for it, but really seeing this increase over time. And it will be really good um, to focus in on the specifics of, of that. And I think the level of granularity will be interesting as well. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's open in terms of the, these fragments and we would we'll try to include um, as many aspects as we, we, we can in, in, in that study. Okay, thank you. Just a quick, a quick follow-up question, maybe. Are you going to use the same tool that you used uh, in your first study? Uh, I mean, uh, the one with the weights of the particular components, uh, especially, you know, the, the, fragment, the fragments that tend to be difficult are fragments with uh, difficult terminology, say. And uh, are you going to take a specific look at the, at the fragments that are less accurate than the um, that the previous fragments and how that translates into gaze. In other words, are you going to stick to yeah. the same tool that you used in the, in the first study? No, and the, the, sorry. the materials. Also, a, a question from Andrea linked to this, whether you're going to use the same interpreter. Right, okay. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so different materials, different interpreters. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a new study. Um, and essentially, yes, um, it would be good to, to, to do that. I think what's what's really interesting is um, there are some aspects that you mentioned there on the difficulty and, and, and so on. There's some really interesting work um, looking at lexical density, concreteness, and um, it's kind of more in the NLP sides of things as well. I, I think it will be really interesting to, again, I'm such an idealist, to have a script or materials that would vary all of these things in some fantastical way. Um, but what I really like about it, and even the data we have from the first project, is that we could go back and apply a different assessment criteria or assessment scheme and, and look at and, and piece it together in different ways. And I think that, um, for instance, 
the you know pauses are something that we're very interested in in interpreting and, and indeed in translation and we saw so much in in the data from the first uh, project um pauses within um, the location of pauses and the impact of those pauses on cognitive load where it appeared that pauses at the beginning of the sentence uh, were more related to increases in, in pupil size than later on in the sentence when we have this very kind of basic, you know, kind of mid-sentence and, and split it together. So I think there's there's a lot, I think, to look at there in this level of granularity. And, and what I've reported on today is is really not at all very detailed in terms of the, the linguistic aspects of it. This is very at the top level comparing one group with another in this kind of all things being equal side of things. Um, going, you know, we really have a wealth of data from this study and it will be really good um, to, to, to zoom in on more of the linguistic features, absolutely. Yes. Good. Speaking of zooming in, that maybe also means we zoom you in again when you have... <laughs> Sorry, that was yeah, a Yeah, it would be really interesting. Position. And, and I yeah. really appreciated the, the comments and suggestions mm. um, for that. Um, it, it's really good not talking to myself after 13 weeks of, of quarantine. Um, I know. But no, I, sincerely, I appreciate the, the comments and the suggestions on the UI, on the linguistic difference. It's, re it's really, really good. And something we don't have so much nowadays of, of this sort of presenting at a conference and getting really insightful feedback yeah, from colleagues. It's true. really fantastic. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Very. I think we have one last question. And uh, Stephen, if you have another a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah, Janus, no. um, can you give us a short version of the question? Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just in terms of your pauses, are you talking about like the inappropriate pauses that are caused by interpreters or hesitations uh, during the uh, uh, speech production? Or yeah, the no, we, saw, we saw both and, and both seem to have um, pauses in both categories. Um, when they occurred early, had more of an impact than when they occurred later. We haven't analyzed this in a robust way, but that was the sort of observation in the data and something, again, making another note to look at that in more detail of the data because it could be very, very interesting. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for the question. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm pleased we had uh, also enough time to have uh, uh, an interesting discussion around this and uh, after a stimulating talk. So I, uh, I can't see any further questions and I think we have, uh, eaten enough into your uh, evening, even though it's lockdown, but I'm sure you... Um... It's, it's lockdown, it's Friday night, you were all my date on Friday night at eight o'clock. <laughs> um, isn't it Thursday? Friday. Oh, oh no, it's Thursday. <laughs> sorry, I got confused now. How far ahead I'm are sorry. you in Australia? <laughs> It just goes to, yeah. I know, it just goes it's, to show one more day to go before the so weekend. So I'll repeat the same thing as it's Thursday night and it's late, so you probably should stop listening to me. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to Not put you on the spot. Hang on. Where I'll are we? I'm my hopes up. It's Friday night. Yes, fantastic. <laughs> Not quite yet. Thank you so much for joining us, for um, giving us this very interesting talk. Thank you, everybody, for joining in the discussion. And uh, so, as you know, um, we'll do, we, we are doing these um, lectures once a month. So um, we'll um, send out the next details. And uh, please do join us. Um, it's nice to have um, the same suspects <laughs> and to, to keep the discussion about this wider topic of human-machine integration and interaction and interpreting and translation going. And uh, that was certainly a very, very interesting contribution to it. Thank you, Stephen. Give our regards to everybody and uh, over mm -hmm. there and uh, good luck with the um, hopefully soon ending lockdown. Yeah, thank you. And thanks so much to Bina and colleagues for, for inviting me and hosting it. Um, really nice to see some new names and faces, but also to see some familiar names and faces and hopefully we can um, see each other in person soon and we'll have some yes. updates on these, these projects that we're all doing. And that drink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs>